Welcome to the Here and Now podcast. I guess I consider myself lucky. Sometime around high school, adults started to ask me what my plans were for the future. Well, not just me, all of us. School was drawing to a close and we needed to make some important decisions about our future. Would we go to university, find a job, start an apprenticeship for a trade perhaps, or join the military? Maybe we could go travelling. For many of my friends, the answer was, I don't know. But like I said, I thought I was lucky. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It seemed that I always had. I wasn't going to do exactly what I wanted to do. That had been thwarted for medical reasons, or maybe even self-sabotage, but that's something I'll come back to later. But in a broad sense, I did know what direction I was headed, and nothing was going to stop me. You see, I wanted to fly. I've told these stories over and over again throughout my life, always using the same one-liners and anecdotes, and I won't reinvent the wheel here. Although, over time with repeated tellings, our personal stories tend to take on a life of their own, like all good versions of the truth should. So the first one-liner I often say is, If my dad was a train driver, it's most likely I'd be driving trains. But he isn't. He's a pilot. And so, for as long as I can remember, I've loved aeroplanes and flying. Well, maybe not the flying part. That came later, but I definitely had a fascination with aeroplanes. So much so that I had very little interest in anything else. And that made it easy for family members come birthdays and Christmas, much to my grandfather's chagrin. Every time I would open another aviation-themed gift, a t-shirt with a plane on it, or a book about planes, another model plane to add to my vast collection, or uh, the greeting card, of course, covered with aeroplanes, he would say, Oh, what have you got there? Not another plane, is it? But I never noticed the sarcasm. I was just thrilled to have something else plane-related, carefully announcing to whatever audience I could muster exactly what type of plane it was and its distinguishing features, the speck of its engine, its historical significance, and how similar or different it was to the other plane thing that I'd just opened. So you could say I was passionate about aviation, and that made most decisions in life easy for me. Did it have something to do with planes and flying? Yes, then I'm in. If not, then eh, I'll be okay. Now, I remember there was a crucial period of time just as I was finishing high school and I was trying to decide exactly what to do next. Now, as I said, I knew I wanted to fly and I'd logged several hours officially already. And I also really loved all things to do with the military. I'd always wanted to be an Air Force pilot, but as I alluded to, that wasn't going to be an option. So I had to make a decision. Did I still want to go into the military, but as something other than a pilot? Or should I go to university? My mum thought perhaps I'd be a good lawyer. Or did I want to try my luck at becoming a pilot in the civilian world? Now having no money to speak of and no interest in going to university, it was really down to whether I was going to go into the Air Force or maybe the Army, or whether I'd get a job and just start working towards a commercial pilot's license. What I did with that license when I got it, I had no idea. I just knew that I wanted to fly. And I didn't really mind uh, what I was going to fly at that point either. So as much as I was passionate about flying, I knew it would be a hard road and possibly my passion for it would eventually be dampened when it came to doing it for a job. Now I found that hard to imagine, but I did worry about it. I'd been working as a baggage handler at my local airport for a few years and I tried to strike up a conversation with the airline pilots whenever the opportunity presented itself. I had a canned set of questions which I'd fire at the unwitting interviewee, rapid fire style, and one of them was, do you do any sort of flying outside of your job? Now most would simply reply yes, they often had a small plane of their own or flew at an aero club, maybe had a share in a syndicate aircraft. But on one particular occasion I cornered a fairly grizzled old captain who grunted when I began to ask him my questions. And when I got to that one, he just looked at me aghast and he said, why the bloody hell would I want to do that? When I get home from work, the last thing I want to see is another bloody aeroplane. I'd rather be mowing my lawns or trimming my roses. Now it was clear that this gentleman had lost his passion for flight. And I found that really concerning, because if it could happen to him, then maybe it could happen to me too. But in the end, I knew what I had to do, as if I'd really ever thought about doing anything else. I knew that if I did any other job, I'd always look upon those who flew professionally with envy. It was bad enough that I'd never be an Air Force pilot, but to miss out altogether was something I couldn't accept. I was going to become a pilot or die trying. That's what passion will do. It will ignore the obstacles, the naysayers, and all of the practical reasons why we can't or shouldn't do something. It will bypass reason and rationale and simply drive you on through whatever it takes to get to your goal. It's not a choice as such, and there's no end state, it's a journey, a path you set out on that keeps you as close to living your dreams as possible. 
And it's not like having passion makes you invincible or immune to setbacks and painful experiences. If anything, it's harder than simply drifting, as you are so acutely aware of what you want to achieve, where you want to be, and it can sometimes seem so far away that it hurts. But life is so confusing and overwhelming that having a passion is like an anchor. It's a focus that you can ground yourself to, no matter how high the swells. You're tethered to this thing which is more than just something you like or are into. It is you. You're inexorably tied to this thing, and it actually comes to define you. It sounds like I'm describing an obsession, and to be honest, there's probably very little daylight between passion and obsession. To be passionate about something is to be obsessed with it. It never seems like work, which is why it's always funny when people ask questions like, oh, you must be really smart to do that, or it must be so hard to learn how to do that. And you smile and nod, but you don't really understand the question because you'd never thought about what you'd have to do to do it. You don't really think about whether you were good enough or whether you could actually do it. You just knew you had to do it, and so you did. It was hard, but it didn't feel hard. It was just what had to be done. That's the other thing about passion. It never really feels like hard work, even though you have to work your ass off. You love every moment. And my story is mine and it has specific details, but I think you could substitute the key words here for just about anything else that people can love, be it horses, surfing, motocross, running marathons, painting. You'd find the same type of description. What seems totally foreign and amazing to most people was just natural and unquestioned by those who are passionate about it. For sure there are milestones and turning points, like the moment when I consciously decided to pursue flying as a career. But like I said, it was Kind of for show, a bit of internal theatre where I acted out a mini-drama, as if I actually had a choice because it seemed like the thing I was supposed to do. But I knew what I would do, even if I pretended that I had a choice. And I'm sure it's the same for others who are passionate about something. But is passion really as extreme as that? To be something one would equate with obsession? It's an interesting exercise to define passion. Here are a few definitions from the Merriam-Webster online dictionary that jumped out at me. 1. The sufferings of Christ between the night of the Last Supper and his death. 2. Emotion. 3. Ardent affection, a strong liking or desire for some activity, object or concept. and 4. An object of desire or deep interest. In historic usage, passion uh, meant suffering from the Latin word passio. That is where the idea of the passion of Christ comes from. So it's bizarre that it has become known to mean something almost the opposite in common modern usage. But there is probably a little of that historic origin tied to the modern expression of passion, and that while it is indeed something about what we desire or have a deep interest in, it's an emotion so powerful that it's almost a suffer to want it so badly. It can be a curse in that regard, the curse of one-track focus on something to the exclusion of all else, and that's where obsession enters. But does being passionate about something also mean to be obsessed with it? Is it possible to really love something but not to have it as the be-all and end-all? The answer, I would argue, is yes. Life often gets in the way of our hopes and dreams, but does that mean we are any less passionate about something? If we are not able to focus on it exclusively at a young age, or if we discover a passion later in life when we have other responsibilities that make it practically impossible to drop everything in the pursuit of that thing, is that not still passion? Perhaps I was wrong to choose to make flying my career. I confused my passion for it at that early age with compulsion. I chose a path which I have since justified as being determined by a passion which was born in childhood, whereas I could have chose a quite different path, perhaps been a lawyer like my mum suggested, and had not had to relinquish an ounce of passion for flying. Perhaps I would be even more passionate about it, as it's not a job that I would have to do, even if I don't really want to. I often think of world-class athletes as the epitome of passion, for it can only be through tremendous passion that they achieve such feats. But when I read Andre Agassi's autobiography, Open, he describes how he hated tennis with a passion. He loathed it, but yet he continued, and he was good, really, really good. Yet as successful as he became, he still hated the game. He became a victim of his own success, a hostage to it. So it is not always the case that passion is the successor of greatness. So coming back to earth, for you and me who love many things, at what point can we say we are passionate about them? Because if you don't necessarily need to be passionate to be uber successful, then is it quite acceptable to be passionate about something that you aren't very good at at all? Of course it is. In fact, it's almost certainly the case. If it wasn't, everyone who picks up a guitar, a set of golf clubs, a fishing rod or a paintbrush would be signing autographs, and that's obviously not the case. Passion, therefore, is not the same thing as talent or even ability, although high achievers probably have it often. They don't always. Finding your passion is something most of us attempt to do at some stage in our lives. There are plenty of self-help guides and websites which will help you to find what you are passionate about that you hadn't realised before. 
Mark Manson, who you might remember from the last episode, he's pretty scathing of passion, and not because he doesn't believe in it, but because he thinks people worry about not having a passion or that they don't know how to find it. And his advice is, who cares? But he also says that you probably already know what your passion is. It's what you do when you don't have to be doing something else. It's what you talk about and think about and what others might say that you're into. The challenge is really how to turn your passion into something that you can do more of and, if possible, maybe make some money out of it. But not always. And I would agree. True passion is not something you need help to find. It finds you. But for the sake of balance, I'd like to consider two diametrically opposed angles of passion, the passion that you didn't realize you had and the passion you don't know how to live with. I find myself in the latter category. My struggle, as fortunate as I am to have my passion, is to find a balance in life. How do I find other things to define me so that not everything I think about, talk about and build my persona around is about my passion? And why would I even want to do that? Well, there are a few reasons. Firstly, as much as I love flying, to others, like my grandfather, it probably gets a bit boring. As rich and layered as it is to me, to others it's one-dimensional. They don't see the nuance and richness of it, but that's fine. They haven't spent their life studying every facet of it. So in order to have a life outside of my passion, a life where I can be open to other experiences well outside of my comfort zone, things I really know nothing about, and the people who are experts in those fields, I need to step back from my world and open myself up to other things. Life has to be about balance. Anything we obsess over comes at the cost of everything else. Now, to reach the top of your field, you have to be obsessive, but at some point you don't need to be obsessed anymore. You've got the ability, you're on the path, your passion is locked down tight, and now you can free yourself to look at the big wide world and learn to be impressed by other people and their passions. We are most humble when we realise how little we know, and we should challenge ourselves to feel that way as often as possible, because it's there that we begin to learn. And here's a little secret. You may learn things from other people who do things totally different from you, which you can then apply to your own passion and make it even better. Now, when on a one-track path, you tend to focus on the skills you need to excel in that area. Your passion focuses you on the specific things you need to do to execute it well. And these are the obvious things, like how to hold a brush or mix colours, draw from the correct perspective, how to catch a wave, every step broken down in perfect, exquisite detail. Now, these skills may not be immediately transferable to other disciplines, but therein lies the beauty of passion. Discipline. Passion makes discipline that much easier because it is never, or at least rarely, a chore. You do something because you love it. It ticks all the right boxes for you. And the practice and dedication required to get good at it requires immense discipline. And that is a transferable skill. So there are two components, the skill itself and the will that goes along with working at it over a long period of time. Now there is a caveat, as there always is. Just because you are passionate about something doesn't mean you're going to be the best at it. In fact, it's pretty much guaranteed that you won't be. But does that matter? Of course not. We aren't all Eric Clapton's or David Gilmore's, Jimi Hendrix or Steve Vai's, but we can still find great joy in noodling away. And the more we noodle, the better we get. And that repetitive practice instills discipline. And that is totally transferable. So now we see passion evolving from this thing we're obsessed about to a thing which has allowed us to focus and concentrate our attention to the exclusion of a lot of other things. And we learn the quality of discipline almost by accident. But there may be plenty of other elements drawn from your passion which are transferable in different measures, and they often are. I think this is why our passions can tend to define us, because the skills that we hone inform our personality and approach to everything we do. It becomes difficult to see the world through any other lens than that which we use to view our passion, which consumes so much of our thoughts and time. Can there be too much of a good thing? I don't think there's a right answer to that question, but my intuition wants to say yes. Obsession is a form of eccentricity which can certainly be taken too far. When you're unable to achieve anything else, particularly the fundamental things needed to survive and maintain relationships, you need to take a step back and reevaluate your priorities. And there's that fine line again, the balance between having enough focus to achieve your goals and enough to maintain your humanity. As passion is an emotion, it can be beyond our objective and conscious ability to control. Just like love, it just rolls up and smacks you right in the face. Discipline works both ways here. It's the essence of passion that allows you to focus your emotions into something concrete and tangible, but it's also what allows us to maintain that sense of perspective of how this thing we are focused on fits into the big picture of our life and how it may be impacting others we care about or who care about us. Passion will almost always have consequences for others, and it runs in concentric circles. Those closest to us will be affected by a lack of attention to anything else. 
and those slightly further out may see how we engage with our passion and be inspired or envious, but those further out still may call us lucky or just naturally talented without any appreciation for the years of commitment and the patience and persistence that it's taken to get to that point. And there's a story which probably isn't true that goes, a woman approaches Picasso in a cafe and asks if he would scribble something on a napkin for her. She offers to pay whatever he thinks it is worth. Picasso complies and quickly sketches something on the napkin. As he hands it to the woman, he says, that will be $10,000. The woman, incredulous, replies, but that only took you 30 seconds. No, replies Picasso. It took me 40 years. Picasso, who probably didn't say that, probably meant that the worth of his sketch was not relative to the sketch itself, but to the years he had spent honing his craft to the point where he could be approached in a cafe and asked to draw something for someone. But he also meant, I've consumed so much of my life in the pursuit of this passion. I've given it everything, and it has given me everything, and that for you to ask me for a slice of it has a value which I can only place an arbitrarily high amount on. It's virtually priceless. And then there are those who have passion but not opportunity, and so cannot devote enough time to become obsessed and realise the potential their passion may offer them. They discovered their passion too late, other circumstances got in the way, and they could only scratch away at the edges, never able to dive right in. All their dreams were stifled, they did not receive the encouragement and opportunities to exploit their passion, never believing they could really do it. It's not a given that passion will lead to obsession. Passion may be a significant source of motivation, but is it fair to say that only those who have focused their lives on it can be labelled passionate? Just how much does one have to love something to be passionate about it? And if someone really does love something but cannot devote all of their time and energy to it, if the excruciating sense of being so near but so far are they then deprived of fulfilment as a result? And is that how we define passion? Not just by obsession with it, but by the obsession with not being able to do it. I love a good cliche, and here's one that seems appropriate. Life is short. I don't know how to be happy, but I'm sure that the more you can do things you love, the closer to happiness you will be. If you are lucky enough to know your passion, then escape to that happy place whenever you can, but don't lose sight of the big picture. Your passion is part of you, but don't let it be all of you. Not all of the time, anyway. You know, the more I think about it, the more I think passion might be about suffering after all. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Here and Now podcast. You can find us on Facebook at The Here and Now or on our website, theherenow2017.com. I'd love to hear from you about this episode or any other topics. You can reach me through the pages or by email at email gmail.com. That's email theherenow, all one word, at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.